Well, good morning, everyone. We'll try that again, will we? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Sir, sure. thank you. Oh, sorry. I thought it was a school there. <laughs> Funny guy. We're going to open our service by a call to prayer and uh, a call to worship. And the men are going to put the short reading on the screen behind me. And it's from Philippians chapter 4. And it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Could you put verse 6 up again? <clears throat> This is written by St. Paul, although God gave him the words. And as you can see, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The Apostle Paul is writing, saying, Worry about nothing and pray about everything. And that is wonderful advice. If only we could take that advice. Worry about nothing and pray about everything. Let's stand for our first hymn that Betty will play us in. And it's all for a thousand tongues to sing. Good singing. Thank you very much. Well, you're all very welcome this morning. Thank you for joining us, and thank you those who are online for watching as well. A special word of welcome to Jeff Higgins, Pastor Jeff Higgins and his wife and children, and Jeff will be taking the evening service as well. Jeff, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for coming. We're going to have a prayer now, if we could all pray together. Let, let, us, let us pray. 
Almighty God and loving Father, creator of heaven and earth, King of kings, we praise and worship you this morning. We humbly ask your forgiveness for our sins. Have mercy on us, O Lord. May your Holy Spirit be our guide and give us wisdom and understanding when we listen this morning to what is said. Enlighten our minds and let your love be upon us. Remember those in our fellowship who are unwell and those who grieve. May they know your peace as they read your word and may they experience your blessing in the days ahead. We ask that your hand would be upon all that takes place in our church this week and especially the two services today. We pray all this through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. <clears throat> now, Mike, is there a children's talk? Mike's going to come and deliver the children's talk, and he's in much better form because Arsenal are doing so much better since the last time he spoke when I was taking the, the service. Thank you, Je uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, boys and girls, good morning. Nice to see lots of you out this morning. Um, on Friday night this week, I had a very scary experience. On Friday night, I got into bed, and I found this in my bed, a snake in my bed. Now, you will be very glad to know it wasn't a real one, but I wonder if anyone could think of a reason why I might have found a snake in my bed on Friday night. What do you think? Um, Holly, why do you think I might have found a snake? Because it was April Fool's Day, that's right. So it wasn't a real snake, it was just a pretend snake, but it was there to see if it could trick me, to see if I would be scared, because that's the whole idea behind April Fool's Day, to see if you can trick someone. And I don't know, maybe some of you tried to play a few wee tricks on people at home or someone in your class on April Fool's Day. It's a day whenever we're going to have a wee bit of fun doing silly things to each other. It's been like that for hundreds of years. We've had April Fool's Day since the 1500s. And it's okay just to play a wee bit of a trick on someone and see if you can get them to fall for your trick. And the whole idea is that if you play a wee trick, you turn someone into an April Fool, and you make them feel a wee bit silly. You make them feel a wee bit daft. You make them feel like, oh, I can't believe I fell for that one. Someone tried to make me think there was a real snake in my bed. Thankfully, I didn't fall for it, and I was just able to get into bed beside it. But sometimes people play really big April Fool's Day tricks as well, really big April Fool's Day pranks. So this year in Australia, the police put this out as a big announcement. They said, from now on, as well as having horses that we ride, we're going to ride camels around Melbourne, and it's going to help us get over all the humps and all the problems of being in the police. And some people believed it. And then later on in the day, they had to say, it was only a wee joke. And I'm sure if you had seen that picture and you had believed that really the police were going to be riding camels around, you would have thought, oh, I feel a bit daft. I feel a bit silly for believing that one. So that was just this year they had put that online. A couple of years ago, Audi, who make cars, on April Fool's Day said, we've made a new car and we would like you to buy it. This car is called the Beatron, and this car is really, really special for two reasons. It's really special because you don't need petrol and you don't need diesel to make it run. Instead, if you put honey into it, the car will run. So it's called the Beatron because you can drive it around and all you need is honey. And maybe now we're thinking that would be a really good idea if someone could invent that and we wouldn't have to pay so much to drive the car around. And the second really cool thing about the car was, just in case you had some extra honey lying around, there was a toaster inside it as well. So it was called the Beatron and it had a toaster inside it. And if you'd gone ringing Audi saying, can I have a test drive on your Beatron? And then you found out oh, it was only a wee joke, it was only an April Fool, you would have felt really daft, you'd have felt really silly. Here's another one that I really like. In 1989, a man who has lots and lots of money called Richard Branson built his own spaceship and he tried to make it fly, but it crashed into a field. And when people came to see what had crashed in the field, Richard Branson and his friend were inside it and they were dressed like aliens. And when people came to see what was going on in the field, they saw these two men dressed as aliens getting out of the spaceship 
And maybe some of them believed, this is real. There's aliens have landed in my field. But then when they found out it was just a silly man dressed up, they probably felt really silly. They probably felt really daft for believing it. We'll do one more. This is a really famous one. In 1957, on the news, on the BBC News, there was a report all about the people who grew spaghetti trees in Switzerland. And they made it look, you can see on the picture, they had a picture of a tree with spaghetti hanging out of it. And lots of people believe that's where spaghetti comes from, that there were special trees. And these people's job it was to grow these spaghetti trees and harvest the spaghetti. And then when you find out the next day it was a joke, everybody felt really silly for having believed it. Because we have these things, and it's good fun, but if you fall for an April's fool, April Fool's joke, you feel really, really silly. You feel like a fool. You feel really, really daft. And you know, boys and girls, there are lots of verses in the Bible that talk about fools. There are lots of verses in the Bible that warn us not to be fools, not to be really, really silly, not to be really, really daft, not to be a fool. And here, here are just a couple of them. It tells us in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. You see, boys and girls, there are some people who don't believe that there is a God. And the Bible says that if you don't believe that there's a God, you're a fool. It says somewhere else in the Bible that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. In other words, we can look up to the sky and we can see the sun and we can see the moon and we can see the stars and we can see big storm clouds and we can see summer days and we can see rainbows and we can see sunsets and we can see sunrises and these things all tell us about how wonderful God is because God made them. And we can look out at creation today and we can see a lovely sunny day and we can see flowers starting to grow and bloom in the spring and we can see animals running around the fields and baby lambs and all sorts of lovely things that God has made. And these things all tell us that there's a God. Because how could we have all of these things if there wasn't a God? And yet some people don't believe that God is real. And the Bible says, if you don't believe that God's real, you're a bit daft. You're a bit silly. Because you just have to look up to the sky. You just have to look out to the fields, to the sea, to the mountains, to all these things that God has made. And it tells us that God is real. So the Bible says, you're a fool if you don't believe that there's a God. The Bible also tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 22, about, about people who think that they're really clever, but really they're just fools. And in this chapter in the Bible, it tells us about people who believe that there is a God, they know that there is a God, but they're more interested in other things. They're more interested in having a nice house. They're more interested in having a good job. They're more interested in playing football or playing the Nintendo Switch or dancing or being really smart in school. They believe that there's a God, but they're just not that interested. There's other things that they're more interested in. And sometimes, boys and girls, that can be us. We can come along to church and Sunday school and Pathfinders and we can hear about God and we can believe, of, of course, there is a God, but we can start to be more interested in other things. And the Bible says, if that's you... You might think you're being really clever, but you're just being a fool. You're being a bit silly. You're being a bit daft because you believe in God and you know about him, but you're more interested in other things. There's another verse about fools in Matthew chapter 7, verse 26. This is Jesus speaking. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Jesus has just been telling all the people how important it is that they make sure that they know God themselves, that they really make sure that they get to know God. Because, boys and girls, lots of us come to church every week. Lots of us go to Pathfinders and Sunday school every week. And your Pathfinder leader maybe knows all about God. And we hear someone from the front preaching from the Bible who knows all about God. And your Sunday school teacher knows God. And maybe your mum and dad know God, or maybe your older brother or sister knows God themselves really well. And you hear all these stories about God. But Jesus says, you can hear all about me, but you have to come to know me yourself. You have to get to know God yourself. And if you don't, you're a fool. 
You're a fool if you hear all about God and you believe in him, but you don't come to know him yourself. Because boys and girls, it's only when we come to know God ourselves that we can have our sins taken away. It's only when we have our sins taken away by God that we know that we can go to heaven to live with him forever. And if we know about God, but we haven't asked him to take away our sins and we haven't got to know him ourselves, we're fools. And if we're more interested in other things, like our Nintendo Switch and dancing and football and school and doing really well in school or having a nice house and having a nice car, the Bible reminds us that none of these things last forever. Only getting to know God, only having our sins taken away, only getting to know God ourselves gives us something that will last forever. So we're fools if we tell ourselves there isn't a God. We're fools if we believe in God, but we're more interested in other things. We're fools if we hear what the Bible says about God, but we don't come to know him ourselves. So boys and girls, thank you very much for listening this morning. I'm going to hand back over to Neil. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Now, I'm going to do the announcements now, and then we'll sing our second hymn. I have to run through these announcements. There are people online who don't have the little sheet that you all should have received, so I'm going to very quickly run through these announcements. Two things before I start. James Barr is having his operation on Thursday. It's been postponed a number of times. So please remember, James, in your prayers, this Thursday, his big operation. And of course, there's communion after the service this morning. If you could stay, that would be wonderful. Monday night. Now, it's called Flowers with Matt Hilditch. Eight o'clock, straight congregational women. Now, Matt Hilditch is a very renowned horticulturalist, well known throughout the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, therefore, there's a small charge of five pounds to pay for his expenses as he flies in on his private jet. Now, Matt, uh, Matt will be here, and it'll be a great night, and it includes a demonstration, and you also get something of your own. If you could let Asha or another committee member know today that you plan to come, that would be terrific. Now, here's the best bit. Tea and trifle will be served at that meeting. So tomorrow night, big night for the ladies, 8 o'clock, flowers with Matt Hilditch. In fact, could you sign up on the sheet on the notice board in the hallway before you go today if you're coming? There's a sheet right outside the door there. Tuesday, Mums and Tots, 10.30. Wednesday night is the missions night, 8 o'clock. Mr. Callum Webster is coming from the Christian Institute. 10th a.m. on Thursday, the morning prayer meeting. Friday at 7, the junior and senior pathfinders. 815 straight youth, and they're going to go-karting. Sunday at 1015, the Sunday school, and the morning service and the evening service next week will be taken not by Henry Berry, but by Mr. Philip Berry from CEF. No, Lauren Mission Hall. Or CEF, Thomas, which is it? It's Lauren Mission Hall. So Philip Berry from Lauren Mission Hall is taking the services next Sunday. And one more announcement. It's in the future. It's Friday week. Good Friday. There are these leaflets available. It's to do with our Good Friday family service. So come and join us on the 15th of April from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock as we remember the great love and sacrifice that God showed through Jesus Christ. It's family friendly, there's special music, and there'll be a short Bible talk. That's Friday week, the 15th, 7 o'clock. And take one of those with you, please, and share it. Now, our second hymn, <clears throat> it's uh, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. During the singing of this hymn, at the last verse, the children can leave us, and then I'll ask Pastor Jeff Higgins to come up and take the rest of the service. Thank you, Betty.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in uh, Strayed once again. Uh, I was going to say it's great to come home, not in the sense of this being my home church, uh, but because I'm originally from Ballyclare, um, we grew up, me and my three brothers, mum and dad, in Bellevue Street, just off the Green Road. And then about the age of 12 or 13, uh, moved up to Rathmina, where my parents still are. Uh, and the last eight years or so, um, I've been uh, a pastor in a church uh, in North Lincolnshire uh, in England. And it's great to be back here again, uh, serving you through preaching the word. But very thankful uh, to the church as well, allowing us to stay in the church house. Uh, we've been in there since Friday evening, uh, and we're planning to stay there until Thursday morning. So we're very thankful uh, to your hospitality uh, and your goodness. It serves us. We've got four kids. It serves us very well. Uh, lots of room in and outside the house, and we're thankful uh, to you for providing that for us over the last uh, few days. Well, as Neil said, we're planning to have uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, uh, a little bit later on. Uh, with that in mind, and also with uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday coming up, I thought it would be good for us to look at the Last Supper in Matthew uh, chapter 26. So if you'd like to turn there, uh, Matthew 26, I'm going to read from verse 17. Uh, down to verse 30. Uh, Matthew 26, 17, uh, down to verse 30. And God's word says this. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into that city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says... My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes, it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, you have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this is the word of the Lord. So let, let's pray. And then we'll come to think about that passage. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and praise you and seek to glorify you this morning, Lord, as we open up the Word of God. Lord, we recognize that as we open up the pages of Scripture, we come to the, the very words of God, words breathed out by the eternal God. And Lord, I do ask that as we open up your word, you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and feet to walk in your way. Lord, we pray that we would be aware of the Holy Spirit's presence among us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, if you'd like to turn back to that passage that I read a little bit earlier on, a man called Israel Saphir was a respected scholar, a respected Hebrew scholar among the Jewish community of Budapest in the middle of the 19th century. He was described as, by one person as the most learned Jew in all of Hungary. He was an expert in Judaism. And when Israel was in his early 60s, a group of Scottish missionaries arrived in Budapest. They had a real desire to reach out to the Jewish community, which was very large in that city back then. And one of those 
Scottish missionaries was a man called John Duncan, or as he got the nickname, Rabbi Duncan. And on one occasion, uh, the missionaries put on a service which was centered on the Lord's Supper at the communion table. Israel decided to visit that service. He wanted to find out what these Christians were all about, and he brought along his son, who was called Adolf. And one of the missionaries describes in his diary what happened uh, that day. He says this, I can never forget that sight. After we end at the supper, Dr. Duncan announced the singing of the 64th Psalm to him who loved the souls of men. And to our surprise, he says, the voice of the old Hebrew rose above our voices. And when we looked at him, the tears were falling on his son Adolf. And the missionary says this, these are days to be remembered. Shortly after that service, Israel and his son Adolf came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This highly influential, respected Jewish man who knew everything it seemed about Judaism watched on as Christians took bread and wine, as Christians remembered and celebrated the Lord's Supper, and his life was changed. It was changed. In fact, despite the opposition that he faced, you can imagine how much a respected man, how much opposition he faced. Despite the opposition he faced, many Jews in that city came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only a couple of months after his conversion, around 30 people were baptized from a Jewish background. It's, it's a wonderful story, isn't it? And notice that it's centered on the Lord's Supper. It's centered on the Lord's Supper. And I think it gets right to the heart of our passage this morning, doesn't it? The, the Lord's Supper, first celebrated here by Jesus and his disciples on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord's Supper speaks loudly and speaks clearly of the life-changing importance of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? In fact, every gospel writer mentions at the Last Supper. But you might ask the question this morning, why is it so important? Well, this simple meal of bread and wine symbolizes the work that our Savior came to accomplish on the cross. That this simple meal, it marks the, the, the change, marks the, the transition away from all of the types and shadows and promises of the old covenant to, to all of the new covenant blessings that are found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Passover, if you like, was being changed. It was being redefined by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that very clearly in our passage this morning. So what do we see firstly in those verses that I read a little bit earlier? Well, we see very simply, very clearly, the importance of the Lord's Supper. The importance of the Lord's Supper. I'm sure all of us here this morning have a day in the year that we look forward to. Maybe Christmas Day. Maybe your birthday or the birthday of one of your children. Maybe FA Cup final day or being in Ballyclare at May Fair day. Uh, they say it's not as good as it used to be. They were saying that when I was growing up as well. We've been praying this year, haven't we, for the, the day when the war in the Ukraine ends. That, that'll be a great day, won't it? We pray for that day. Well, Passover, the day that began that week-long celebration of unleavened bread, the Passover was the day, the day, that every Jew looked forward to. This was the day when they remembered and celebrated God's redemption. God's redemption taking them out of Egypt at the Exodus. That night when the Lord passed over, passed over those Jewish homes whose doors were covered with the blood of the Lamb, the blood of that sacrificial Lamb. A memorial meal was celebrated a memorial meal of unleavened bread and bitter herbs and, and lamb. All of this was shared to remember, to remember and celebrate their Lord's redemption, the Lord's rescue. Rescue through uh, the blood of the lamb, rescue out of bitter slavery in Egypt. I think it's well summed up back in Exodus chapter 6, 
verses 6 and 7. This is before the Exodus. This is God's promise to his people that he would bring them out of the Exodus. And it sums it up so clearly what God would do. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. He says, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens, the, the bitter burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens, the, the heavy burdens, the bitter burdens of the Egyptians. And that happened, didn't it? And this was their special day, the day that they look forward to more than any other day. But notice in our passage in Matthew chapter 26 that it's the night of the Passover. It's the night of the Passover celebration. As they were eating the Passover, it says in verse 20 and verse 26. Mark, Mark's gospel says this, Mark 14 and verse 12. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrifice the Passover lamb, it's as they eat the Passover, as they remember God's redemption to his people out of Egypt at the Exodus, it's during the Passover. As they're eating the Passover, they begin to take the Lord's Supper, we're told. They, they begin to eat bread and drink wine. And this is so this is so important. It's not an accident that the Lord's Supper was first taken at Passover. You see, Jesus is very clearly making the point to his disciples that he is now our Passover. He is now our Passover. God's word says that, doesn't it? In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, we read, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. I'm sure many of us know that wonderful verse in John chapter 1 and verse 29 where, where John the Baptist says this, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Revelation chapter 5, the, the exalted Lord Jesus Christ who is at the right hand of his Father in heaven. How is he described? Well, he's, he's described as that Lamb, that, that sacrificial Lamb who has been slain. Christ, or Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Through his blood, his blood, he would ransom, he would redeem, he would rescue people from all nations. So Jesus is very clearly describing himself here as, as our Passover. And he, he knew that and he understood that in a very real sense, didn't he? The, the very next day, Jesus' body would be broken. His blood would be shed on the cross as that once and for all sacrifice for our sin. All of the sacrifices of the old covenant, including Passover, were pointing towards this ultimate sacrifice on Good Friday. It's through the blood of Christ that God passes over our sin. God's wrath and judgment fell on Jesus while passing over us. And that's wonderful news, isn't it? It's through faith, isn't it, in the, the, the crucified Savior that we experience the forgiveness of sins. We experience a new relationship with God and a new covenant. And we experience the hope of heaven in our hearts. So we take bread and wine, and we're going to do that a little bit later on. We take bread and wine to remember and to celebrate that wonderful reality of what Christ has done. You see, as we're reminded here in the passage, Jesus' death was not a tragic accident. He wasn't a, a victim to the Roman authorities or the Jewish authorities. This, this wasn't plan B. No, it was God's sovereign plan all along. It was long promised. It was long expected. It was long anticipated. And we get hints of that in this passage in, 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 in the Last Supper. Notice in the passage that Jesus sends his disciples to prepare the Passover meal in a certain man's house. We don't know who this man was. But notice what Jesus tells his disciples to say to this man. Verse 18, when you go to this man and ask to borrow his house for the Passover meal, he says, remind him that my time is at hand. My time is at hand. Later on in verse 24, 
he tells his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem as it is written of him. My time is at hand, and I must go as it is written of me. What's Jesus saying? Well, in other words, his death, remembered and celebrated at the Lord's Supper, was always God's plan, God's salvation plan. He had come into the world for this time, for this purpose, as it was written. It was long promised, it was long predicted, it was long expected in the Old Testament scriptures. There are many places that we could turn to this morning, but we could think of Isaiah 53, couldn't we? Which speaks of the the suffering servant of the Lord, the one who would be pierced for our transgressions, the one who would take upon himself all of our iniquities. We could think of that wonderful chapter of Jeremiah, chapter 31, the promise of the new covenant, the promise of forgiveness of sins and a new heart and a new relationship with God. It was written, it was promised. This was always God's plan. And it wasn't just God's plan in a a general sense, in a, a, a big sense, in a bird's eye view type way. No, even all of the details that led up to Jesus being crucified on Good Friday were part of God's plan as well. And we're reminded of that here, aren't we? Even, even Judas's betrayal was part of God's plan. Even that was written, even that was prophesied. Jesus refers to it himself, Psalm 41 and verse 9, where it says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Of course, as we're reminded here, Judas acted according to his own will, according to his own sinful desires. We see that, don't we, in verses 14 to 16. It was a shocking act of betrayal, in fact, wasn't it? It would be similar to President Zelensky of Ukraine turning around and telling the world tomorrow that he's going to Russia and siding with the Russians. Judas's betrayal was shocking. But notice that nowhere do we read in the Bible that he blamed God. He doesn't say to God, well, it was part of your plan, so you made me do it. I had no other choice. You you twisted my arm up my back and I couldn't do anything else. Yes, God was sovereign over his decision, but Judas was responsible and he knew that he was responsible, didn't he? Later on, he, he felt the personal guilt for it. He tried to make amends, But in the end, the guilt just got too much and we read tragically that he killed himself, facing only the judgment of God. Judas was responsible and he knew it. But as we're reminded here, it was written. It was written. So we see see the importance of the Lord's Supper, don't we? As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which I'll read a little bit later on, The Lord's Supper very clearly proclaims the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the death of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And we come this morning a little bit later on to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves as the hymn puts it, that this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's our song as we take bread and wine this morning. Christ is or Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us, and we praise God for that. His betrayal, his suffering, his death for the forgiveness of sins was all part of God's sovereign plan. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't plan B. It was written. And his death opens up the way for for all of us, any of us sinners, to come and take bread and wine for all who are trusting in Christ. We do it, don't we, in remembrance of him, in remembrance of him. So we see very clearly uh, the importance of the Lord's Supper. But we notice something else in this passage as well. We see, secondly, the participants in the Lord's Supper. The importance of the Lord's Supper and the participants uh, in the Lord's Supper. At one stage, when Charles Spurgeon was the pastor of the, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, a group of people in that 
church stopped taking the Lord's Supper. They stopped taking bread and wine. You see, they thought that there was a, a number of people within that church who were not worthy to take bread and wine, and they were protesting. If they're taking bread and wine, if they're sitting at the communion table, then we're not, they said. The article I read put it like this. Certain members were not partaking of the Lord's Supper because in their judgment, inconsistent and unworthy persons were coming to the table. Never lacking in wit, Spurgeon responded like this. That's highly probable, he said, but he may be wearing your coat and looking out of your eyes, he said. And then he went on to say this. If you have the faintest, feeblest faith in Jesus, then come. If you have the faintest, feeblest faith in Jesus, then come. Come to the table. See, I think that story helps us answer a very important question that's raised from our passage this morning. Who can participate in the Lord's Supper? And in one sense, the, the answer is very obvious, isn't it? Disciples of Jesus Christ take part in the Lord's Supper. We see that very clearly from the passage that I read earlier. But that, that begs another question, doesn't it? What about Judas? What about Judas? Did the Lord give bread and wine to Judas? If he did, then, well, maybe that might throw a spanner in the works. Clearly, Judas took part in the Passover meal. We, we read that. But when Jesus says to his disciples, take, eat the bread, drink the cup, all of you, was he speaking to Judas as well? Well, the Bible seems to suggest that Judas left the room, as it were, after verse 25. The Lord made it clear that Judas would betray him, and after that, it, it seems like he left. It, it's not so clear in, in Matthew's gospel, but if you flick over to John's gospel, John chapter 13, John 13, I'll read verse 21, down to verse 30. John 13 and verse 21, it says, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him, some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. He immediately went out, and it was night. I think that's verse 25 of Matthew chapter 26. Judas left, we're told. He was a counterfeit disciple. He looked like a disciple, didn't he? He talked like a disciple. No one really thought, did they, reading these passages, that he was the chief suspect. But on closer inspection, behind the scenes, behind closed doors, he wasn't a true disciple. All the while, he was plotting against Christ. In the end, he betrayed the Lord. He died a tragic death and he faced the judgment of God. So, what can we learn from this? Well, only true disciples, true disciples are the only participants in the Lord's Supper. But then that, that begs another question, doesn't it? What does it mean to be a true disciple of Jesus? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, God's Word tells us to examine ourselves before we come and take bread and wine, before we take the Lord's Supper. And sometimes that can make us feel a little bit uneasy, can't it? What does it mean to examine ourselves? Does that, that mean that I have to be at a certain spiritual level every time I come to the table? 
every time I take the Lord's Supper? How, how good is good enough for God? If I've struggled the last month, then should I really take it? Or, or should I let it pass by? If I haven't read my Bible as much this month as I did the month before, if I haven't prayed as much, if I haven't loved the Lord as much as I did the month before, then should I let it pass by? What, what does it mean to be a true disciple? What does it mean to examine ourselves? God expects seven out of ten, and I've probably been about a five. Is that good enough? What does it mean to examine ourselves? What kind of disciples does Jesus expect at the table? Well, I think our passage really helps us answer that question, doesn't it? As we have said, it seems clear from the Bible that Judas didn't take the Lord's Supper. Yes, he took the Passover meal, but there's no evidence to suggest that he took the Lord's Supper. And we all know that he was a counterfeit disciple anyway. But the true disciples who did take the Lord's Supper were far from perfect. Just think about some of the disciples for a moment. And notice, notice in our passage that they knew, they knew deep down in and of themselves that they too had the potential to betray the Lord. Notice what it says in the passage, each one of them around that table it says, ask that question. When Jesus says someone was going to betray him, each one of them says, is it I, Lord? Is it me? Am I the one that's going to betray you? Luke 22 and verse 23 says, and they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And John's gospel says something similar, left to their own devices, handed over to the enemy, then they too would have betrayed the Lord. Not only that, but the, the gospels make it very clear, don't they, that the disciples were slow learners. They found it hard to believe Jesus' teaching. Often they just didn't understand. They were unbelieving. They found it hard to pray. At, at Jesus' most crucial moment, they found it hard to pray. Peter, we all know that Peter would deny the Lord three times, even though he resolved, if his life depended on it, that he would never betray the Lord. And the other disciples weren't far behind him. And yet, yet, Jesus gave them bread and wine. Paul tells the less than perfect disciples in Corinth that the Lord's Supper is for you. It's for you, and we all know that was a church going through many difficulties. But yet it's for you. As Spurgeon puts it, our faith is often faint. It's often feeble. But if it's faith in Jesus, faith in Jesus, faith in in his death for the forgiveness of sins, faith in those wonderful new covenant promises, faith that one day the crucified, risen Savior will come again and bring us into the Father's kingdom. If it's that kind of faith, faith looking to Christ for our all, then we're welcome to come to the table. As faint and as feeble as that faith might seem, we come. And that begs the question, doesn't it? Do we come to the table this morning relying on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you come as a repentant sinner? Do you come as a, a new covenant believer, far from perfect, but relying on the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life? Is, is that how you come to the table this morning? Do you come to the Lord's table knowing that one day soon, we will sit down at that great banquet in the Father's kingdom. God's word reminds us, doesn't it, that God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He, he looks at the heart. And, and that's true when we come to take bread and wine as well. We, we cannot hide from him. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And that begs the question, what does he see? Does he see a disciple fully aware of their own sin? yet deeply grateful for the forgiveness that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today, and like Judas, you, you look like a disciple, sound like a disciple. 
Maybe everyone else here this morning thinks you're a disciple. But you know better. Behind the scenes, behind closed doors, when you go home after the service and close your door, you know deep down that you aren't. You're not trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Well, the warning is there, isn't it? Repent of your sins. Trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, even now. And then come and take the Lord's Supper. So as we take bread and wine in a few moments, we come focusing our hearts and our minds on Christ and Christ alone. We examine ourselves, yes, but not to see if we're good enough for God because we'll never be good enough for God. But we examine ourselves and remind ourselves that Christ's sacrifice was good enough for God. And that's why we sit here this morning. If we're following him, then we come to take bread and wine. We come to remember and we come to rejoice in all that Christ has done. As faint and as feeble as our faith might seem, and often it does, I know that by experience, I'm sure you do as well, still we come. We come to renew our faith in Christ and our desire to walk in his footsteps. So we see the importance of the Lord's Supper. And secondly, the participants in the Lord's Supper. And may God speak to us uh, through his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you and bless you for your word this morning. And in a, a few moments as we come to take bread and wine, Lord, we pray and Lord, that your word would have spoken to us this morning. Lord, would have challenged us and comforted us and, and pointed us away from ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was going to Jerusalem to die and to rise again, that through him we might sit at the table, no longer eating crumbs, but feasting on the work that Christ has accomplished for us. Lord, we pray that you would uh, speak to us through your word uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and, and sing once again.
Father, as we bring this part of our service to a close, Lord, I pray that each one of us here this morning will be able to say, it is well with my soul. Not because of anything we have said or done or will ever do, but all because of Christ, the one that we now come to remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Well, we're going to begin this time of uh, communion, gathering around the, the Lord's table by singing the words of how deep the, the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Very appropriate words as we come uh, to take bread and wine. Let's sing. to invite Peter and Rachel Lawson up just before we protect to welcome them into membership and um, the members have voted to receive them happily so I'd just like to invite them up to extend the hand of fellowship to them before we protect. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take just a a few moments of quiet reflection and thankfulness. Then I'll ask Ralph to give thanks uh, for the bread. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning afresh as we come before you, Lord, we, to take of these elements. We thank you for your body that was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. We thank you, Lord, for going all the way to Calvary to take upon yourself the sins, our sins and my sins. We thank you, Lord, for the pain that you suffered for leaving the the realms of heaven to come down to this earth to take upon yourself the sins of the world, that we might be forgiven, that we might be washed in the blood of the Lamb and that our names would be written in the Lamb's book of life. So, Father, we give you our praise and our thanks afresh this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we remember the the body of Christ at Broken for us. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let's remember as we now take the cup. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your blood that was poured out for us. Lord, we thank you that you willingly came to the cross knowing what was ahead, that we could be made right with you. Lord, we think back to the garden where your sweat was like blood, the anguish, the dread that was on your brow, knowing what was ahead. But you did it willingly to redeem mankind, to redeem us. And Lord, we just thank you for this new covenant, this new way that we can live close with you, not with the blood of animals, not with sacrifices that mean, are meaningless in many ways, but with the greatest sacrifice of all. And Lord, we just pray that you would just help us to remember that. And we thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. let's drink together. Well, as we bring this time to a close, I'm going to read these well-known, wonderful words, reassuring words from Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is intercessing for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're being regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.